Hello, debaters and dictators. My name is TB Skyn, and here's a topic that's definitely gonna be a lot of fun in the comments. Sexualization in League of Legends. Now, my jumping off point for starting this discussion is going to be Hashinshin's video, Observations of Sexualization in League of Legends. It's going to be a link to that down in the description. And what Hashinshin does in his video is essentially he goes through League of Legends and talks about how he's noticed a pattern of sexualization happening with the champions of League of Legends, especially the women, that there is a lot of sexualization going on there. And again, I'm not really here to comment, especially on Hashinshin's video in particular, but I'm using the fact that he's bringing up this this point as a jumping off point for having my own little discussion because I thought it might be useful to define exactly what we're talking about when we talk about sexualization when it comes to character designs. Now, the first thing you need to know about sexualization is that it is a neutral term. It's a descriptive term. That is to say, it doesn't make a value judgment on the thing it's describing. So if you say, oh, that is sexualized, you're not saying it's bad or it's evil. You're not saying anyone involved with it was a monster or, you know, some kind of, of, of sexist or anything. You're saying this thing has the characteristic of being sexualized in the same thing that you might, same way that, way that you might say, oh, that is red or that is blue or that is tall. It is just a descriptive term. So it doesn't come with a value judgment. The other thing to know about sexualization is that it's not a binary. That is to say, it's not either something is sexualized or else it is not sexualized. It's a spectrum. Something can be somewhat slightly sexualized and something can be incredibly super hypersexualized. And there's like a huge range of possibilities in between. The third thing you need to know about sexualization is that it is 100% it is inarguably no discussion needed, no need for a debate, nobody played devil's advocate in the comments. Sexualization is 100% absolutely a part of character design in League of Legends, and in fact it's a very important part of character design, and it's an important part of many of the character fantasies that League of Legends tries to deliver. This is because sexualization is a character design tool. When you're designing a character, you can choose to sexualize them, you can choose not to sexualize them, and that choice informs how that character comes across when you put them in the game. Again, this is not good, this is not evil, it is a choice you can make, and it is a choice you can criticize. So, sexualization isn't bad on its own. Like, it's not just sexualizing anything isn't bad unless, you know, it's underage. Like, Annie, please stop doing that, fan artist, it's really fucking creepy. But the context within something is sexualized can reveal problems. For example, who gets sexualized? In League of Legends in general, among the champions, when you think about it, which ones tend to be more often on the sexy side? And what you'll find is, so long as we're thinking about human and female and adult champions, because we don't want to be fucking creepy here, the women. The women tend to have more, like, being sexy is more often part of their character designs, and with the men, much more often, being sexy really doesn't kind of doesn't really play into their uh, to their character fantasy, and that's where the problems can start to emerge. Is when certain patterns of character design develop that cause strict limitations to the kind of character fantasy that you can deliver on, to the kind of character stories that you can tell. So just as a just as a thought experiment, like without going into a list and checking it out, as I have done here, without going into a list, without like going down, down the checklist and figuring it out, just think to yourselves and name a female champion, human, adult, don't be fucking creepy, whose power fantasy includes being ugly. N name one who isn't, co well, let's start here, let's name one who isn't conventionally attractive. Like, just League of Legends, human female champions, who aren't conventionally attractive. Now, I tried to do that, and I pretty much I came up with a Lowie, because she's like, she's buff rather than being slim, which is the conventionally attractive thing. And then there's Kale, because she's completely covered in armor. Although, even Kale is a little bit uh, dubious, because they actually went ahead and gave her. Let's see if we can find it. They went ahead and gave her boob plates um, in the latest update to her base splash art, as you can see here. And the function of boob plates, as we've talked about in this channel before, the function of a boob plate on an armor, is, from a character design perspective, is to tell the audience, Hey! Hey! Hey, there's some boobs underneath here! Hey, th this one has boobs! There's breasts! Breasts here! Breasts here! Come get your breasts! 
that's that's the function of it in that character design. You can easily design a piece of armor for a female character that doesn't include them. So when you do include them, it's because you want the people who observe the character design to know that they have breasts and they're female. And again, this is a character design choice. It's not good. It's not evil, but it's a choice. And like all of the choices, it can be criticized. So. What I'm going to guess is that you really can't name any adult human female characters in League of Legends who aren't conventionally attracted because they really they really aren't any. Callista kind of comes close because she's got that whole kind of emaciated wraith thing going on, but she's at the same time it's like change her skin color and get rid of those nails there and she would look fine on a date. Like you, you could you could take her to a restaurant and nobody would really bat an eyelash or be like, "Holy shit, that's that's a terrifying monster. And no, she still looks mostly ordinary human. There really isn't a female ergot, by which I don't mean just an ergot, but 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 a lady. But there is no female fantasy in League of Legends that includes being ugly. And for a lot of people, that might sound like, yeah, of course there isn't. Who the hell wants to be ugly? Why would anyone ever want to be ugly? Well, that's still a power fantasy or just a character fantasy that it can be fun to explore for the same reason that like people want to play Gragas because it's kind of fun to embody that fantasy of just being the loud, fat, drunk man who's like I'm fucking I'm blowing stuff up, causing a big brawl. Like that's a fun fantasy. That's a fun thing to embody. That's fun to tell stories about. And it's the same thing with Urgot, especially like more so old Urgot, the new Urgot, and we've talked about that before, but Urgot is a champion who's really not about being attractive. He's about being this hard-bitten sort of underground uh, rebel against the authority who's like, I hate what this shitty nation has degraded into. I'm gonna become an underground rebel and I'm gonna lead a rebellion that's gonna restore this nation to its rightful place where power is valued above all. And he really hates Swain because Swain is all about being sneaky. Urgot is this very primal power fantasy and that doesn't really exist for female characters. You can kind of almost get there with characters like Elise, where you can turn into a giant ass ugly spider, or Cassiopeia, who is a snake lady, but their fantasies, like the power fantasy that their character designs present, or just the, the, the story that those character designs present, still involve being beautiful, still involve being attractive. Like for Cassiopeia, it's especially uh, blatant because like her whole thing, like uh, certainly her, her old lore, I might be misremembering her current lore, but her old lore was very much about how she was someone who was obsessed with beauty and kind of as a punishment for that massive obsession with beauty, she was turned into this hideous snake monster, except when you look at her, it's like, not really that hideous, is she? Like she's got a snake body, but the rest of her looks perfectly gorgeous and, 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 and attractive. And that's where the criticism of League of Legends comes in. That's when sexualization can become a problem. And this is something we talked about before. When sexualization is the default, when making the character attractive is the default, it's just a thing you do because well, that's just how you do it, instead of being a creative choice that you think about that informs the character that you're creating that's important to the character you're creating, then it becomes a problem. And that applies, by the way, to both male and female characters. There's definitely, like, when you, in, like, a, a Marvel superhero movies, for example, none of the male leads are ever unattractive. Like, they're all, they are all always kind of, like, even, like, the new Peter Parker, like, I do love Tom Holland in that role, but for me, the, the, the story of Peter Parker was always that awkward, kind of gawky nerd with terrible social skills and who isn't really very conventionally attractive, who isn't really very cool in any way, shape, or form gaining access to this secret identity where he can be cool, where he can be attractive, where he can be the, the, the hero of the day, even though in his daily life he's still just a kind of a, a gawky nerd. And then you look at uh, people like Andrew Garfield and Tom Holland who have played the character and you're like, feels like they missed out on that part. So it's a, it can be a problem no matter the gender it is applied to, because again, it's not, it's not a gendered problem specifically, but the pattern, and this is what Hashinshin notices as well, is that if you're a lady in League of Legends, if you're a female character, you can have all sorts of different fa power fantasies, but they just literally always include being beautiful or cute or attractive in some way. You can't have one without it. There is, there's no option to be, you know, the female Urgot. There's no option to be the female version of, of um, uh, like the female version of Graves, for example. Like, there's no heart-bitten bandit with a shotgun and a, and a grievance. There is no freaky, eccentric super scientist with cyborg replacement parts like Victor, 
who's sort of changing themselves into something else and they really like there's a there's a very hard limit to the kinds of things you can be if you want to be that and female in League of Legends. And that's a creative limitation. It's a type, I consider it a type of self-censorship. <clears throat> when your character designers look at a character, okay, this character is, uh, like, they're, they're a badass, and they're really strong, and they have a vengeance, and they want to kill, and they have this horrible deformation, like this terrible scarring that just kind of has torn their face apart, and they look terrifying, and everybody's scared of them, and they look completely deformed, and they have a hump. And then you think about that character, and somewhere you go, oh, so they can't be female then. We can't make an ugly lady. We can't make a fat lady. We can't make an unattractive lady because, oh, nobody wants that, which is an assumption without a lot of evidence behind it. Like, why, would, why wouldn't that be interesting to play? Why wouldn't that be interesting to tell stories about a character who is that way, to explore that fantasy, to explore what that thing is? And the thing a lot of people is probably, are probably going to come at, back at me for that on when I bring that up, is is like, but it's about appealing to horny twelve-year-olds who just want to jerk off. It's just about, like, it's just about making rule thirty-four. It's just about, it's about what sells. It's about what's commercial. And the thing I'd like you to realize is that I don't give a flying fuck what's commercially viable. Like, I'm not here to make excuses for the design because oh, it sells. Yeah, I don't care if it sells. Heroin sells. That doesn't. I'm. <laughs> lots of things sell. But that doesn't mean that selling them is artistically meritous. That doesn't mean selling them makes like artistically justifies the choice of the thing you're selling. Right? I'm criticizing the art here. I'm not criticizing the commercial strategy. I'm sure, yeah, sure, whatever. Sex sells. That's a truism that's not entirely proved or backed up by data, by the way. But sure, if that's what you want to believe, fine. But I'm not criticizing the sales figures here. I'm criticizing the character designs. Now, Ari, for example, let's talk about sexualization when it's appropriate and inappropriate. Ari is a character who kind of needs to be sexual because that's part of her fantasy. This is something we've talked about before with Misfortune, for example, um, and, and, and Elise. Their characters, like, Ari needs to be kind of sexual because she is a succubus character. Like, that's the story of the character is that she's a succubus. She she charms people, that's even part of her kit. She draws them in close and then she kills them. Like she's the the, de the deadly seductress. The 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 woman who you really shouldn't have tried to lean in and kiss because then she stole your soul. That kind of thing. So that's part of her fantasy. So the sexualization makes sense for her. Right? So there's a there's a connection, a strong connection between the story that's being told and the character design that's on display. Now imagine if Officer Caitlin was Caitlin's base skin. Now, Caitlyn, the character, is the sheriff of Piltover. She's a dignified, high-society lady whose parents, uh, like, encourage her to go into, um, into, into being a detective, into being a crime fighter. She's someone who's very concerned with justice. She's someone who's very concerned with people, bringing people to justice and, you know, maintaining the order in the society of Piltover. Now, I have some serious qualms about Caitlyn's base character design, because I don't think it's very good, but if you told, try to tell me that that is the story that applies to this character, I'd be like, no the fuck it's not. That's, no, it's not. That character design is a stripper. That character design is a stripper. Like, that's not a highly dignified society lady who's the sheriff of fucking anything. That is a stripper with a sniper rifle. That's what that is. That's where sexualization, we, we have the discussion with appropriate and inappropriate sexualization for telling the story of the character, right? Sometimes the sexualization can help the story, as in the cases of a character like Ari, as in the case of a character like Elise, who is literally the Black Widow, that is, the thing that, that promises you sex and then kills you. In these instances, it makes perfect sense to have that feature, but then you have characters where it just, it doesn't, and that's where my criticism of Caitlyn's base design is like, I can think of a lot of things that Caitlyn's base design communicates to me. Officer of the Law isn't really one of them. Like, when I think officer of the law, I think like a uniform, I think like institutionalized dignity, I think of, of conformity, I think of, of um, you know, uh, being rigid and kind of stiff, and that's, none of that really applies to Caitlyn, right? And it's the same when you talk about a character like Kaisa, the story of Kaisa is that she's this, ah, oh, she was abandoned in the, she was like lost in the void when she was a child, and she had to scrabble to survive, and she had to bond with like one of the corrupting spirits of the void, one of the voidlings, like she had to bond with it and form a symbiosis with it in order to survive in this harsh environment, and she has been fighting the void on her own for years and years. And she looks like a, like, 
a sexy Instagram model or Scarlett Johansson. It's like she's got her titties out and she's got a skin tight bodysuit on and it's like there's a disconnect between what the character's story is telling me, what what the story the, the story that the design is supposed to communicate, and what the design is actually communicating. This design communicates to me that she's a hot, sexy lady who is about being hot and sexy for some like what, how does being hot and sexy play into the character fantasy of being a hard bitten survivor? It's not really like if you look at, for instance, the recent uh, Tomb Raider reboot. One of the things the character designers understood is that. If they want to tell the realistic-ish, air quotes, story of Lara Croft, like to turn her into like kind of a real human character who goes through all these hardships and who has to become the Tomb Raider, then giving her PS1 era Lara Croft's boobies and, you know, the, the, the skimpy uh, the short shorts and the thing in the tight shirt and stuff, that doesn't really work. You have to go with a different aesthetic approach, whereas modern day Lara Croft's character design, that sort of heart bitten, that more realistic, that sort of more vulnerable, like where she takes a lot of damage, she has a lot of battle scars and stuff like that. That wouldn't really work in the kind of pulp adventure story that they were telling with the original Tomb Raider, where you run around shooting dinosaurs in the tomb of some ancient people that have never actually existed. The character design has to fit the story that you're trying to tell with the character, and Kaiza is one of the examples where that just isn't happening. Another, by the way, another general criticism I have of League of Legends is, specifically when we're talking about Urgot and characters like Swain and stuff, is that League has been in the process of updating a lot of old champions and sort of getting rid of the old jank that used to be part of who, who they were. And in that process, one of the things that has happened is that they have kind of killed ugliness in the game, or they're in the process of killing ugliness in the game, because old Urgot was this shambling bloated, fetid, disgusting monstrosity. Like, nothing was cool about him. His his power fantasy wasn't really about being cool. His power fantasy wasn't about being attractive. His power fantasy wasn't about being in any way appealing, really. It was about being this unappealing, shambling, horrifying, disgusting, you know, abomination of science that is just kind of barely held together with stitches and leaking fluids all over the place. That was who he was. But now it's about being, you know, a hard-bitten cyborg badass who's out to, you know, change the fabric of Noxian society and throw down the man! And that's a very different fantasy, and something that Riot has been in the process of is simply put removing ugliness from the game. And that, in the same vein as how too much sexualization can be a problem, because it's a creative limitation, I feel the same way about the removal of ugliness, about being unappealing from the game, like, that that fantasy is being removed, I think it's an issue for, for the for the creativity of the game because it limits the kinds of stories that you can tell. It limits the kind of characters that you can create. It limits the expression that you can have within the game. And by the way, in case anyone's wondering, I'm not saying Riot doesn't have the right to do any of this. It's their game. They can do anything they want to it. They can replace every single champion in the game with, you know, giant titty babes with huge asses and just, like, super sexy and nothing else, and that's completely within their rights, and it is completely within my rights to not like that, and to criticize it, and to make an argument for why it is a bad decision for the general storytelling and the general creativity and the general quality of the game, which is what I'm doing here. Okay, <clears throat> so this is the part of the video where I have talked about the stuff I know something about, where I can say, I'm a character designer, I'm an artist, I have some competence here, I have some education here, I can speak on this with some authority. That was the first part of the video. The next part of the video, we're going to be talking about some stuff where I don't really have an education. I don't really have expert knowledge. I want to recognize my limitations um, <clears throat> on this aspect and say that if you want more information about the stuff that we're about to talk about, Seek out other critics, seek out other people who talk about this issue, who have more of an education than I do, who have different viewpoints than I do. Educate yourselves, because I can only tell you so much. So let's talk about gays. And I say that G-A-Z-E, just so we're clear, gays, right? Just, just so we're clear what we're talking about here, which is something you may have heard before in the context of the male gaze, <clears throat> which is a... A principle that evolved out of a school of film criticism, I, th I think specifically feminist film criticism, to describe particular patterns of behaviors with um, male directors when it came to photographing the female form. And if you want a, a clear demonstration 
um, of what uh, male gaze means when it comes to film. Just watch literally any Michael Bay movie or indeed Transformers and check out the way that the camera looks at characters like Megan Fox. Like that's what critics tended to talk about when they talk about the male gaze is a presumption that the camera is heterosexual, the camera is male, and it looks at things that heterosexual males want to see. That is women's breasts, women's asses, like women's lips, and doesn't really care about important stuff like women's thoughts and women's opinions. <clears throat> that was sort of the, the, the primary concept of it. And that has since been criticized and rejected and expanded upon and sort of uh, <clears throat> rehabilitated and all kinds of things have happened to it, and it has been transplanted into many different mediums. It, like, it's been taken out of film, it's been applied to novels, it's been applied to comics, it's been applied to video games. And that's where we get into um, some of the troubles that, that can happen when it comes to appraising what is sexualized, what is not sexualized, when is sexualization important, is you have to, and that's, that's the main argument of the gaze theory, is that you have to assess the perspective from which the medium is showing you the thing. So when we see a character like Kaiza, is this a character design based in the male gaze? Where, like, a lot of people would say, kind of, yeah, it is, because this is a character design that chooses to highlight her sexual characteristics as part of the character, right? That is the presumed heterosexual male gaze thing to do. So this is a character design that's, that's influenced by that particular version of the gaze. Now, I should stress, this is a contentious subject in film criticism and indeed everywhere. Like there's a lot of both, like both feminists and, and you know, conservatives and, and reactionaries have all kinds of different opinions on this. And it's not a universally accepted theory. I want to stress that, like, because there's questions when it comes to gaze theory in terms of if you can have a male gaze, can you then also have a female gaze? And if you have a female gaze, wouldn't that be the same as a gay male gaze? Like, doesn't that appreciate the same things about the male? And if it doesn't, what's the difference between a female gaze and a gay male gaze? And what's the difference between a male gaze and a lesbian gaze? And by the way, what if someone is neither male or female? That's a thing. Like, a lot of people identify themselves as neither male or female. What does that look like? Like, can that be included in a theory of gaze where we assume that the only interest that a viewer can have, like, will always have something to do with physical sexuality? What if a person isn't interested in sexuality at all? What if they're asexual? Like, what if they don't have a sex drive? Can you, can you have an asexual gaze? A gaze that just does not have any sexual characteristics at all? And these are all questions that are being debated. <laughs> And I can't give you an answer on them. And again, I'll put some links down in the description to people who have no more knowledge about this than I do. So if you want to learn more about it, go there. But the reason I bring up gays is because it ties into one of the primary issues of sexualization, which is that it is entirely contextual. Sexualization is not a universal thing. It's not, there's not one thing that is universally sexualized. For instance, everybody has individual preferences. For some people, Kaisa is hot as hell. Like, it's just, wow, the titties and the lips and the booty, woo. That's the kind of woman that you want. And for other people, that's Ilawi. Like, they are much, much more interested in, in observing a character like Ilawi as a sexual object. And that's a personal preference that you kind of can't really account for with a unified, like, saying, okay, the, everything is sexualized along the same scale because it kind of isn't. If a person has a particular sexual interest in big, buffy, uh, buffy, big, buff, muscled ladies, then they're going to sexualize a character design in different ways than a person who is very interested in breasts, for example. So there's all kinds of different sort of axes of sexualization where you can kind of move the sliders along. And that's why sexualization is best described as a spectrum. Um, that is not universal. It's also not universal from culture to culture. There's a lot of cultures in the world where female breasts are not sexual. Like, they're just not sexual at all. Like, women can walk around with their breasts out and nobody bats an eyelash because that's just... That's just, just normal. That's just how you do. It's not a sexual thing. It's not sexy. Nobody gets a boner because of it. Nobody gets turned on because of it because it's not at all associated with sex and sexuality. And conversely, you have some cultures where things that we here in the West wouldn't consider sexual at all, are highly sexualized. Like, there are certain cultures in the world where ankles are incredibly sexy. There are cultures in the world where the back of a woman's neck can be incredibly sexualized. And that, again, for different cultures, 
there's a different scale that has to be applied when it comes to judging whether something is sexualized or not, because the context is, is heavily dependent. Now, when it comes to League of Legends, you can kind of safely assume that the scale you're judging on is kind of a Western, semi-worldwide Western pop culture idea. And we have sort of Western beauty ideals to live up to. We have sort of uh, Western sexual ideals to go by. But it's important when it comes to criticizing this stuff generally. Like when it comes to criticizing, like when you're looking at Bollywood movies, for instance, the discussion about sexualization is a little bit different there. And you have to keep that in mind when you have that discussion. You can't just apply one size fits all sexualization to all character design or to all visual mediums. It's not it's not a thing you should do. Okay. That was, that was the stuff I'm not a super expert on, it's just stuff I thought I should bring up and at least recognize that this is this is something that's there, and if you want to know more about it, links down in the description. So we're going to end um, by... I just wanted the chance to answer a question that people ask me a lot, because I've done multiple videos where I criticize the sexualization of a character, and so I wanted to talk about why I don't criticize Battle Bunny Riven and why I don't criticize something like uh, Pool Party Fiora. Like, I'm not really... In general, when I appraise a League of Legends character, if they have an alternate skin where they're super sexy and walking around in a hot outfit and, and, and the skin is very, very sexy, I don't really care so much about that. Because the thing, when, I, when it comes to me judging a character, like how good of a character design is Kaiza as an expression of, of her base character, I'm not really going to give her bonus points for, for example, um, hang on. For, for example, like she has a, a her launch skin for Kaiza is this badass jet lady here. When I appraise Kaiza as a character, I'm not giving them bonus points for creating this cool badass Robotech, like space gun goddess bullet angel skin. Like that doesn't really give me give them any bonus points when it comes to executing on the character concept of Kaiza because the base design, like the, the thing that is the bedrock that's supposed to form the basis for the entirety of Kaiser's design still looks like this. It still looks like a generic titty babe with no consideration for how her many years of desperate survival in the void should have affected her or should be expressed upon her. So I can't really give them bonus points, but by the same token, if a character like Riven has a battle bunny skin, I'm not going to look at base Riven and go, oh, well, hmm, pff, this is clearly a hyper-sexualized character. Like, this is clear they're not taking it seriously. They're not doing the right thing by the story. Not really. But the thing I will do is, if a character has nothing but sexy skins, I will criticize that because that indicates to me that the designers, like the, the people who make the skins, don't really have any ideas. <laughs> about what to do with the character. Like, they only have one idea, and they're going to do that over and over and over again. And Evelyn is one of the characters to whom that kind of applies, where I've been a little bit disappointed that, like, her her base story of Evelyn is that she's a demon who uses sex and sexuality to seduce her victims, and then when she has them seduced, that's when she inflicts as much pain upon them as she possibly can, and she feeds on that. For those purposes, her base design needs to be sexy. Like, that that's very much part of the story that's being told. That's part of the fantasy that's being explored. That's part of the idea. So, of course, she needs to be super, super sexy. Makes perfect sense. But then I look at her skins, and it's like, there really isn't any of these th that aren't sexy. Even, like, the closest we get is Safecracker, but even there, it's still, like, still booty and titties, and she's sort of the sexy thief instead of being the sexy demon. But... All of them are conventionally attractive, and that's one of my disappointments with Evelyn skins, is like... Couldn't you have had one where she's like just this horrifying claw monster who wants to kill... Like, couldn't you explore that fantasy as well? Couldn't you explore a fantasy where she isn't attractive? Isn't that another option? And that's where I might criticize and say, okay, they need to get some more creative ideas about what to do with this character, because the whole point of skins is that you can explore ridiculous alternate fantasies is you can put Riven, who's very much not a sexy character, who's not a, well, slightly sexualized, but that's a discussion for another day, who's very much not a character who's about sex at all, into a Playboy Bunny outfit. And hey, that's funny, like, that's cool, that's, oh, let's do something weird and wacky and different with her. But you can't find a way to do Evelyn where she's not attractive at all, where she's not even the least bit hot. You couldn't find a way to do that. That's, that's a limitation, right? 
and another thing I'll talk about in in terms of like if I if I wanted to appraise skins, I would say who gets the sexy alternate skins? Like who gets the battle bunny ribbon skins? Who gets the skins that are meant to turn them, to, like to make them sex objects? And that's not again sex object is not. It's a it's a very loaded term, but it's not in itself. A negative term. It's, it's a descriptive term. A character can be objectified or not objectified as a choice in the terms of storytellings that you do about them. Who gets the sexy skins? Well, when you look through the lists, mostly it's the ladies. Like, the ladies tend to get a lot more of the sexy skins, and the dudes tend to get a higher proportion of the badass skins, like the ones that explore different fantasy where they're also a hard-bitten badass. And that's one of the things I'll criticize about the skins for men in League of Legends, is that the men don't get enough sexy skins. Like, th there's a lot more opportunities to do sexy skins for the dudes in League of Legends. Ones where, like, you'd be showing off the package, you're showing off the good stuff. And, like, a character like Darius is kind of ripe for that, but he doesn't even have a debonair skin. He just pretty much just badass, 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 and nothing but badass. And that, again, kind of boring. But, again... I won't fault the base character design for that. I won't evaluate the base character design based on that. Anyway, that was just something I wanted to bring up because a lot of people have been asking about it in the comments, and I saw an opportunity to answer the question. There's a link to Hashinshin's original video down below. There's a link to a couple of other resources if you want to look into some of the stuff I discussed in the second half of the video. And I'm out of breath because I've been talking very fast for a very long time because it's kind of late and I'm tired and I want to go to bed. You can leave your comments down below and I'm sure... A lot of you will. <laughs> I don't mind that. I don't mind debate. I just... Could we just please not use a lot of slurs and weird accusations while we're doing it? That, 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 that would be nice for me. If you like the video, there's a like button right there down below that you can click on if you're so inclined. I also do have a Patreon. If you have an extra dollar that you don't need, uh, then that one dollar alongside the other dollars that people are already giving to me uh, it helps me out a lot in terms of keeping the lights on, in terms of having food and stuff. I really appreciate it because this is becoming an increasingly large part of my livelihood now and uh, <laughs> I can't believe how lucky I am that I get to just make videos like this and that somehow pays some of my bills. But I am very grateful for that. So if, if you have an extra dollar, then you, you can throw it to the Patreon. If you don't, of course, that's completely okay. I'm just grateful that you've watched the video this far. If you didn't like the video, you yeah, know what? That's fair. Like, this was very much an opinion video. This was very much kind of a, a, a punditry thing alongside. It's also a serious examination of a concept and character design. Yes, but it was also very much an opinion video. And if you don't like that, if that's not your jam, fair enough. I'm not going to make up a silly story about why you shouldn't click the dislike button. If you didn't like it, it's fair enough. You can click on it. Thank you very much for watching this video so far. Uh, I have started the pay, uh, podcast, by the way, with a former designer at Riot, Patrick uh, Scarisart Scarborough, who is now a full-time Twitch streamer and uh, talks a lot about game design as well and who does a lot of great Twitch streaming. He's a good friend of mine. We have a lot of fun talking. There's going to be a link to the podcast down below as well, as well as in the end card that's coming up in just a second. So if you're interested, take a look at that. If not... Fair enough, I will see you in the next video, and thank you very much for watching.